Hey folks, welcome to the Bay Shed Podcast. My name is Ryan Roberts. Today on the show is Trevor Jones. Trevor Jones is the house bass player for the Marriott Theater just outside of Chicago. Uh, he also works with Jason Heath on Contrabass Conversations and the Double Bass Blog. Uh, you should check out both of those. One's a podcast, the other is definitely a blog. Um, uh, Trevor and I cover kind of a, a variety of topics from talking about production and some things he's interested in. He's staying artistically engaged with during quarantine. Uh, we're gonna. He's going to talk about that. He's going to talk about his original group, Molehill. Uh, I have links to the band up at thebayshed.com. Uh, go to the podcast page, go to Trevor Jones, and then you will see everything there. Um, and go check out the band. The band's cool. I had not heard the band prior to our conversation, uh, but after our conversation, I went to go check out the band. Really cool stuff. I'm into it. Um, I'm really into it. He's going to he's gonna talk about how the, there's a Muse vibe, a vibe that is similar to the band Muse. I want to make sure I say that correctly. Um yeah, I heard that. I heard that, but there's some other things too. There's, it's not so kind of, ah, oh man, I don't know. I, I kind of hate using descriptors to to define music or define somebody else's music. Maybe it's not so, it's not so theatrical or dramatic. Um, it definitely kind of has some of those epic qualities that that Trevor and I will discuss, but it's not not this super big thing. I think what I heard a little bit more. And Molehill was a little bit more of a Queen influence. Uh, Which is funny because I just described it as not theatrical and Queen was very theatrical. But uh, it's still, it's not, it doesn't go as far as Muse did, I guess, down that road. I don't know. This is why I hate talking about music. And I always like other people to explain their own music. Um, I think, ultimately, you should go listen to it and... um, you know, collect your own thoughts about it and see how you emotionally identify with the music. That is always the best all the time. Uh, yeah, there's all that. This is normally where I would plug D-Lake and Basses. Um, and that's it. That's my plug. Yeah. Hey, Dan. How you doing, buddy? Um, I got nothing. I got nothing. I, I talked to him earlier this week. There's not a lot of new stuff to talk about there. There's always a link up at the website. Go check him out. Go check out his website. Um, but that's all I got on D Lake and Basis, but I do want to give them a shout out. Anyways, here's my conversation with Trevor Jones. How's your day going? Man, <laughs> you know, it's like when the highlight of your day is like, well, I did the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, man, you know, some days it's just not better than that. <laughs> right. No, no, it's like, well, yeah, you know, I did the dishes. <laughs> all right. That's a win. It's like, you know, sometimes I, my dad and I have always joked about, like, you know, we, they, my parents still live in a place where they have a yard. Mm-hmm. And we're always like, man, one of the greatest things ever is, like, cutting the grass because you can just look at it and go, oh, my God, I accomplished something. Yeah, I did something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's right. like, that's the battle some days. It's like, I just want to say I did something. Right. Right. Yeah. And, like, I was on the phone earlier with my dad. Uh, today and he's uh-huh. like you know he's kind of like went through the list of just chores that he's gotten done and like the ones that he's looking to do you know like they painted the house my folks are still together they yeah. painted the house like a week and a half ago you know now he's looking to like regrout a bathroom and so you know like oh my god that's awesome <laughs> at least you got something to do <laughs> you know? yeah, totally that's amazing i uh you know i went to ralph's earlier and uh, which I don't, I don't, they don't have those in Chicago, right? What's what's the Kroger grocery store in Chicago? Um, well, they do have Kroger. Um, okay. And they have, I mean, God, I go to, I mean, I go to Costco, but um, yeah, Kroger's still like the chain out here. But I mean, God, we're like so spoiled here. I mean, you can go Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, Costco, like whatever. I mean, they're also, you know, I one of my favorite places to go in chicago or mexican groceries like the produce is super cheap and it's really so good. cheap i yeah. know it's so cheap like when i used to live up in north hollywood there was a spot like that close to that apartment and like man you could score on some oh. produce oh yeah it's, it's ridiculous yeah i i've always lived 
close to one um, in, ex, until I moved to the place that I'm in right now. So they were, you know, I'd go there and I'm like, 10 limes for a dollar? That's cool. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Margaritas right. this week. Yeah, <laughs> game on. <laughs> <laughs> Man, so what have you been up to? What's, um, have you been staying busy? Well, I am. Um... I try to keep a, a pretty, well, I shouldn't say tight schedule, but I try to basically do some, I have a bunch of buckets. Um, for the okay. first couple of weeks of this, I was playing uh, Greece. My my main gig is playing at the Marriott Theater, which is a theater um, outside of Chicago. And I finished playing Greece, And then the week after that, I was basically just waking up you know, working out, eating breakfast. And then I just do something, try to do something creative for like two or three hours. So typically that's either writing for my group. Um, or I've been, I've, you know, the artist Kimbra. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I joined her, um, is it, um, Patreon, Patreon, however you want to say it. Um, I'm sure there is one way. But uh, I right. and she's like been putting out some stems from some of her songs, so I've been having a really great time digging into those, and I've like remixed a couple of her songs, and it's oh, just uh, cool. yeah, it's just a really fulfilling exercise. I learn a lot just about um, like she worked with Rich Costi, who's uh, one of my favorite mixers and producers, and to be able to listen to a stem from that he mixed is like yeah just that in itself is like a pretty pretty fantastic study so um i've been having a really good time doing that and uh and yeah writing for my group we're hopefully recording in the at the end of Ju uh, july nice i don't know much about kimbra obviously i know uh you know her work with gotier yeah and my friend my friend frank abraham was doing a bunch of road gigs with her for a while um oh cool and and that's like kind of all I know. Uh, I haven't really checked out much of her stuff. Maybe, you know, there's, there's, a, there's like mentally such a long list of things I need to check in on <laughs> as far as listening goes. Uh, and she's on the list. I just, I haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, the track she just put out, at least this, she put out the stems to it. This track like came out in 2014 or 15. It's called Miracle and Thundercat is playing bass okay. on it and singing and so it's really you know fun to hear his uh you know hear his work um in that detailed of a way but i mean her that record man she collaborated with so many people on that um lots of writers but she is like she's just the total package she's an incredible yeah. producer in her own right and um a vocalist i mean she's just great um so That'd be a cool song to start with. <laughs> nice, yeah. nice, Thundercat. I remember, I got, uh, <laughs> I got emailed some tracks. I was, I was playing on this. My friend Rocky, is a hip hop producer, and he was like, just, I think just finished the Kendrick record, mm -hmm. uh, the one that blew all the way up, and I forget the name of it, because because D'Angelo came out with one at that time, right? And I always forget which one is to pimp a butterfly. Yeah, so that that's Kendrick, and then Black Ma Black Messiah was um, okay. That was D'Angelo. Yeah. yeah. So then he just finished to pimp a butterfly, and he sent me some tracks to play on, and I I sent him back, and he's like, "Man, make it sound more like Thundercat." <laughs> <laughs> and, and I knew Thundercat was on the Kendrick record, um, and I'm like, "Okay, well, huh? I've never really checked out Thundercat. Like, <laughs> like Thundercat's piano player is a friend of mine, and so like that's kind of just." where i stopped with thundercat like i never really got into him but i went and started checking out a bunch of thundercat and i'm like huh i don't play like that at all <laughs> let's see what let's see what happens yeah he um that kendrick album um the first track on that wesley's theory uh george clinton is on it and mm. it was one of those things like i remember listening to that the first time and i'm just like man George Clinton is just such a through line for so much like deeply influential music. And oh yeah. He is just like, you know, when you look at someone like Dr. Dre, you're just, I, I'm sure they they've spoken about this many times, but it just like, man, when you hear the first chronic album, you go, cool. So you really did just sample P funk, like for an entire album. <laughs> right. And, and then, you know, he's, uh, you know, obviously a brilliant producer, but um, you listen, you listen back to that, you go, Oh, it's P-Funk. 
just with yeah. an up, updated production. Same <laughs> with doggy style, like Snoop's doggy style, like yeah. Snoop Parliament all over that thing. Yeah, and so I just like, man, I just look at George Clinton. I'm like, man, he is just this through line for so many different acts. Yeah. Um, and is just, uh, I mean, man, he's got one of the best Instagrams out there. I don't care. <laughs> oh, I haven't checked that out. Oh, my God, man. That guy, you know, he, he that is like the definition of living. But, I mean, he's, he's had a hard, you know hard life in some ways too but uh man what what an incredible creative output for a career yeah what's um uh, what's the nature of the band that you write for uh my my band um we started off more i guess in the alternative rock realm like we got compared to muse all the time okay and um more just i'd say instrumentally than anything but um are you coming at it with those kinds of with those kind of sonics like are you playing key bass on it as well um like is it really kind of produced electronic element to it yeah we i mean i played uh i mostly play i play bass guitar like probably 80 percent of the time but on our last ep that we did well i guess we had key bass on every recording we put out but a lot of them are just simply like sub pads and then there will be like a distorted bass guitar over the top of it okay Um, but the last DP we put out, definitely it's like those three songs. That's it is synth bass. So live I'm playing like key bass and that's yeah. It. Yeah. So so that's been yeah, that's been cool. And yeah, I've been getting into that a lot more. And I really I really enjoy programming. So um, that's been a, a, well, I mean, I've been doing that forever, but it's it's a nice thing to dig deeper and deeper into. Right. Right. Like, yeah, they, again, like there's a I kind of. When I chose when I when I chose my lanes within the world of bass and within the world of music, like I, I really just <laughs> I stay in my lane. <laughs> uh, I never really got into production. I, I have tried to produce uh, a couple records. Um, I think two have made them out into the world, uh-huh. and it's just I don't know. I can't. My head just doesn't go there. I don't think I work well in those scenarios. Yeah, it's it's um. You know, I think it's cool sometimes, I mean, like going back to this idea of like having these stems and just seeing or I should say hearing what a production like a really great production sounds like. And you're just kind of like, um, cool, they clearly got all great people in this room for this. But then you also wonder, were there a lot of outtakes that just didn't work at all? How long did it take them to get to this? How much did how much input was from the, you know, the executive producer, Rich Costi, how much input was from Kimbra. And it's always like, I think the cool thing about working in a collaborative setting is that you're always like, you know, obviously trying to figure out uh, something that will yield the, you know, the sauce that everybody wants. Sure. Sure. But yeah, but producing that, it's like taking that, you know, the view from the top, yeah, it's not it's not for everybody, and it's cool when it's uh, to, to me. I'm sometimes always like really happy when I'm doing something, and I go, "Okay, I'm not good at this. That's <laughs> great. That's great. That's I'm really glad I understand this is not my thing." <laughs> right, right. That's actually why I got in. That's why I ended up being involved with the production on those two records is to see if to see if I liked it, to see if yeah. I liked the process, to see if I you know, how I worked within it and all that. I'm personally happy, uh, you know, just geeking out on bass lines. And <laughs> you guys do that. Like, I'll I'll stay over here and, you know, hopefully be the specialist within these, this side of the, this side of the thing. You guys go and do that. You do yeah. it well. I'm not going to try to double dip and, you know, suck at something you're already doing better than me. <laughs> Totally. And I, I think it's also, um, you know, one of the things I really actually enjoy about working in theater is when you're like doing the initial rehearsal day um, or multiple rehearsals for a, a show, you know, my whole thing is always like, you know, it's like going to the studio, you're like, cool. And, you know, I, I got the music ahead of time. You know, I have these, maybe I'll have a part, you know, usually in a show you have a part written out. You know, sometimes you get slashes. But um, you go in there with maybe a tone that, you know, like I just played Grease. So I'm like, I'm yeah. putting flats on an old P bass. 
and I'm going to go in there and kind of get that, that type of sound. And I have a good relationship with my music director, so I typically will just like send them an email in advance if there's any question to the sonic approach and say, hey, do you, do you think something more like this or more like this? And he'll say, I like that a lot more. But I really, in a way, it's like great not having those decisions put into your hands more than just offering um, right. a couple different directions. And then someone else can have that eagle eye view of everything Go, no, no, that actually works a lot more. And you go, cool, no problem. Now I'll, I'll just execute the part. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I... I... I, I, there's, I, I really like that too. When it's just cool, tell me what to do. Great, I'll do that. Um, because then if it gets into too much, well, let, let me make sure I say this correctly. If given the option of like, no, do what you want to, cool. And then you, you know, you make the best musical decision you can. <laughs> then yeah. then I, I'm going to be a little bit pissed. Not super <laughs> pissed, but I'm going to be a little bit pissed. We're like, yeah, no, not that. <laughs> well, well, why? Why? Because, like, I feel like, you know, I really took all things into consideration. You know, like, you're rejecting. What do you want, then? You know, and they'll tell me something completely different. I'm like, okay. Okay. That's why don't you just tell me that. Oh, man. I did a session for a friend a few months ago, and I think it was on a bridge or something. And I had, you know, pre-recorded some ideas just to send over to him to make sure we were on the same page before we actually got in the room together. And... Sure. We, we sh I, you know, I show up and it was one of those classic, uh, co hey man, I really like the direction. Could you just make it like 50% simpler? Yeah. And, <laughs> and I'm oh, like, gosh. sure, no problem. And right. it was one of those things. I thought the bass line was cool. I thought it worked. I didn't think it got in the way of the vocal at all. Sure. And it was, it was just this little step out moment on the track and it just got shot down. And it was like, cool, I just got to... It's that's not my decision, so no problem. Right, right. <laughs> I feel like I feel like they, from my experience, there's not a lot of uh, maybe understanding of the what the impact could be with a more active bass part. Mm -hmm. The tune went; it was a big deal for a minute. It was a Charlie Puth tune called "Attention." Oh I, yeah, man, that is a that that chorus bass line is awesome. And I remember like the first time I heard it. Um, I was living with one of my friends who, who owned a studio and I'm like, dude, check this out. Check this out. Like everything about this track is completely killing Yeah, everything. Like sonically it's happening. Like what the tune is about is great. Like how they produce it. Everything is amazing about this tune. Mm -hmm. And I loved that there was such an active bass part in it as well. Yeah. So again, I go back to this idea. Um, maybe this is out there somewhere. Um, online, but I'm really curious how that part came to be. Was the bass sure. line there first? Was the song there? I, I don't know if it was a Jamaria artist that recorded that because I know um, Dimitri, tall, he's tall bassist on Instagram. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, no, I, 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 I know Dimitri. I've, I've asked him to be on the, he was doing the road gig for a while. I yeah. Asked him to do the podcast and haven't heard back. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious um, how that bass line came to be. Yeah, it, like, yeah, did, what order it came in, um, you know, in a way, it, you know, it's just a nerd thing to, to know that. But um, it, it is a uh, man. It's an awesome bass line. It's so cool to hear that on like a big on a huge pop song. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I agree. And um, without it having like it's just pop pop. It's not like, you know, Jamiroquai neo disco. Sure. Yep. Pop, That's right. But it's like straight down the middle pop on everybody's radio pop. Yes. <laughs> um, is on, on the Patreon thing where you get the stems, is there any kind of behind the music information about Signal Chain or um, how they produced any aspect of it? Um, it wasn't, I mean, I'd have to go back and look. I don't know if anyone, sometimes people post questions. She, Kimber's great at like responding to people. And, she, you know, she's done a ton. There's a ton of content out there on her talking about her creative approach and everything, but um, I don't, I don't know if I've seen anything on Signal Chains for that um, particular tune. But she's, you know, she's done a bunch of different interviews, like for audio companies, where she'll like go through some of her live setup because she has a pretty, um, a, a pretty intense uh, vocal setup that she does live, where she'll, 
you know, loop herself and she'll control all her own effects and everything. She's a, oh, that's cool. Yeah. She's a, 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 a brilliant technician. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so back to your band, it's, it's, it's got a muse vibe. They're always described. I mean, they're just kind of, um, you know, it's epic, I suppose. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think with them, um, you know, I'm not here to define any, any group for anyone else, but, um, you know, it becomes more and more challenging. I think the further you get in your career, not to, um, um, you know, to, to keep just pushing into, into new right. spaces. And yeah. And then also, I think if you've been unbelievably successful, there's some like level maybe that, um, pressure that you feel, um, you know, it's like, okay, cool. Here's the formula. Like, let's not completely run away from it. Um, let's tweak it. But of, of course, you know, I mean, some of my favorite artists run away, <laughs> always run away. The next thing's always uh, uh, totally different, yet it somehow um, glues together because it's that person that keeps being involved. So sure. I think who with, are those who are those artists for you? Oh, like Bowie, for sure. Well, yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, stuff. I think he's like the, you know, in some ways, like in, in uh, you know, cult culturally, <laughs> like, the, the you know, one of the the people that's uh, done that. Um, you know, man, really putting me on the spot here. I might have to edit this while I think about this for a second. Um, you know, sometimes I like really think about instrumentalists more just because of my background. Like, sure. you know, to take like Marcus Miller, for instance, um, you know, it's like he's played on so many recordings like some of my favorite work of his is playing with brian ferry and like um brian brian ferry is in uh i mean for anyone who already doesn't know this i'm sure most do but um brian ferry was a lead singer in this band called roxy music and then after roxy music brian ferry had this incredible solo career i mean he's still putting records out and i remember hearing his album that came out in 2006 um and Marcus, and I, I heard this track, and it was just this little interview, uh, interlude. It was called BF Interlude. And I'm just hearing this bass. I'm like, okay, cool. That's definitely Marcus Miller. Like, yeah, no yeah. one else sounds like that. And it was just crazy. And so, anyway, I guess I really admire people like him. I mean, for many reasons. But also, he just plays on so many different things, and he's still him on all right. of those things. And so in right. some ways, maybe I find that to be something to, you know, go for. Justin Meldal Johnson's the same in, 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 to me, like, you know, he started, I got to know him when I was like 12 and Odile came out uh, with Beck and he, his bass playing was on that. And I strangely at 12 was just like, oh my God, I don't know why, but this is awesome. Yeah. And he's been one of those, I have followed his career as long as anybody in the music industry. And he's one of those people, no matter who he works with, it's like always him. Yeah. And that's just such a, a, a you know, God, it's what we all, all go after. <laughs> yeah. Within, within the bass player, uh, world, Pino is that for me. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, I was just talking uh, about him on a podcast. I pre-recorded earlier this week and it's i mean that dude it, like it's insane it's insane. like nine inch nails jay dilla celine dion tears mm -hmm. for fears adele ed sharing you know after like really digging into the information that's out there on his discography pretty much if i've liked the track in my life it's pino on bass <laughs> like that's what i find out like oh man that was him too i love that song so there's this there's this guy that occupies this other space in my life that I didn't really know that he occupied until I realized everything that he recorded. And it's this bass player, Preston Crump. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. And like, you know, he played, you know, Outkast, Goody Mob, like, you know, all the all the Southern, uh, you know, kind of Southern funk hip hop that was coming out during that huge era with organized noise. And. He's I just, also on like, Britney Spears' huge breakout record, right? Like, Hit Me did, Baby I, One More Time, I think is Preston. I did not know that, but, you know, when you think about the timing of when all that music was coming out, it makes sense that people would be like, who is this bass player on all these incredible records? Yeah. 
And so that, man, that makes sense to me. I, um, but he, he's one of those people that when I listen to, um, I'm just like, Oh my God, he's like on the soundtrack of my life. Mm -hmm. Um, Come, you know, coming up when I did and listening to the records that I did as, you know, as I was, you know, getting older. And um, yeah, those people like now one of my um, I mean, it's just kind of a, a little project. It's nothing, nothing crazy. But I just kind of keep a Spotify playlist of all of these like really influential tracks. Um, and I slowly like sometimes once every couple of weeks, I'll just transcribe like my favorite eight or 16 from it. Yeah. And then I'll just post it on my Instagram and I'll like, you know, always try to find the person there and tag them and everything. And it's actually uh, led to some like kind of cool interactions. Like Preston actually responded to me on one of them. <laughs> and, and, you know, I just wrote him like, dude, man, like, thank you for everything. Um, yeah. you've been hugely influential on me. And, um, dude, did you just, did you just, when, when he hits you back, did you just fanboy out a little bit? There's been, Two specific times on Instagram where I just straight up fanboyed out. Like Lee Sklar responded to me. Once. Oh wow, that's awesome! And like I hopped in my car and drove to the Troubadour that night. Yeah, <laughs> like to go meet Lee. Yeah, it was cool. I um I think he just left a comment or something, or he liked something. So I I forget what the actual interaction was, but it's just kind of like man, there's so many people that um have worked in this industry for so long that are you know, have have contributed at, at just an exceptional level for like a whole career. And like, yeah. you know, no one knows their name. And it's like, just, you know, it's my own small way of, it's almost like, you know, a digital journal of music yeah. that I really like. And then just trying to say, hey, this is, this is the person that was a part of that, you know, unbelievable collaboration. And that's right. That it, it feels good to, to do that and, you know, of course, just revisit this music that, I, uh, that I've loved for so many years. Yeah, there's something about that. I mean, maybe, uh, you know, maybe it's my age, you know, like I'm coming up on 40 here in a few uh -huh. years. I'm kind of rediscovering old music has kind of been my, my thing for the last, like, I don't know, year and a half, two years. Yeah, absolutely. I am... Um... It's funny how you can go back to a record you started listening to when you were 14 and, you know, 20 plus years later, you're just like, oh, my gosh, I hear this completely differently. Right. Like, I think about them like, oh, that's an interesting um, uh, tone or, or EQ decision. For the rap <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you're like, you know, at, at 13, you're just like, I have youthful angst. That is yeah. the only thing I know. <laughs> right. this, is, this is helping that. And it's. But that's like, it is really fun and satisfying to do that. You know, I also, man, I, I make a real point to listen to new music every single week. And um, that's good. I like I like that that's, you're staying disciplined about that because I, I don't. But it's cool. Like everyone goes through phases with that. I just like, I think um, there's so much, there's such an, you know, the ecosystem now of how people discover artists and it's, you know, different for everyone. It's so... It's so profoundly different from when we grew up. And so um, I try to, to stay, you know, not like, you know, it's not about staying on trends. I still gravitate to the stuff that I think is really cool. Like when I heard that bassist I mentioned, Justin Meldal Johnson, when I heard he produced Paramore's last album, mm. I had never, you know, I had listened to the big hits by Paramore and I never really got into him. And I was like, okay, if he's working on this, I've got to listen to this because. I'm just interested in this combination and it is right. super musical album and it is straight up pop. Um, it's really different from previous Paramore records, but when you run an album or, or music through somebody like JMJ, there's just, a, there's almost like there's no way it's not going to turn out in a pretty different way. And I remember sure. listening to it. I'm like, wow, this is a really, really cool album. And if I wasn't like trying to stay open for that, I never would have uh, never would have discovered that. And that ended up being one of my favorite pop albums of the year. <laughs> Man, I think I think that that's that that uh, what you just said is a really crucial thing in to any musician is just staying open to music. And I just think it's such an exciting time because you don't like if you don't like it, it's it's like fine there's there's something 
out there for you. And there are a bunch of other people that also like that thing. No matter yeah. what, if you do some work, you're going to find something that really resonates with you. And then just go do more of that and support that group or individual or whatever. But I just, um, you know, I want to stay on this topic a little. I joke with the guys in my band, in particular, the drummer that I work with, his name is uh, Devin Staples, monster player. Um, and I always give him a hard time, just like joking around. I'm like, you know, man, the thing with musicians that never ceases to amaze me is like the idea of like trying to be cool all the time and like not, <laughs> and like the whole, the whole idea of like, if you really dig something, not actually showing that you're enthusiastic about it yeah. and just kind of being like, <laughs> you, like shrug about it. And I'm like, as you can yeah. probably tell, I've always been the kind of guy I'm like, dude, if I like something, I'm going to tell you. And then I'm going to tell the next person. I'm going to try to spread. Yeah, the word. exactly. And, and, and I just like, I'll never not be like that. Cause I just get too excited about music every single day of my life Yeah. to, to like ever, you know, if I really hear something and I dig it, I'm not just going to like shrug and then not, you know, right. Right. I got to keep this, this musician cool. Yeah. Uh, atmosphere going. Yeah. I just, I just like, I guess to some degree, I, I just, it doesn't, acting like that doesn't really resonate me. And like, I, I want to be clear. If people, I don't care that people act like that. I just find it to be funny. And um, it's definitely, it is, it's a funny part of, of musician culture. Yes. I think it's good to define why you don't like something. I actually think it's good to work through that. I don't find working through it in a public like space, in a rant. Right. style <laughs> is something that's productive for me i will say however that i do enjoy a good rant but love the rant yeah it's it's also the kind of, i think the idea is you know too with music it's like okay what was what was the purpose of creating this music and if you're going to get upset at a dance track that doesn't have enough harmonic um deep harmonic language in it it, yeah. it you might be you could be wasting your time um Yes. That might not be the best thing to, to spend your time doing. So I'm always like trying to I identify sometimes if I'm getting to, you know, this level, like, you know, what was the what was the purpose of this track in the first thing? What was the vibe the artist was trying to get across in, um, you know, in this composition? And if they've largely succeeded in that, um, like if you're listening to like a Robin track and everybody's dancing at 3 a.m. in the club, there's a significant amount of success <laughs> to, to that production. I do, I do think too that having gripes about pop music or or whatever you're talking about, I it's still like it's a good it's a good thing to be critical. Like just I guess sometimes I uh, you know it's in particular when you talk to somebody who's like obviously angry at a lot more than just the song, <laughs> and then you're just like that's what well, it is. They're angry about their childhood or something. Yeah, they're yeah. Just taking, like, they're just taking it out on Kanye. Yeah, yeah. It's like, man, if you're actually just really this angry, I probably maybe just don't want to talk to music about you uh, about music with you. Right. Um, cause I like being critical about things too. I think that's how we, you know, one, one of the ways we learn and get better, but, uh, of course. <laughs> to, to just have a complete session for hour after hour, I don't think probably does a lot of people very much good. Although I, I, I simultaneously love Bill Burr, the comedian. So oh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan. I'm a fan. Yeah. Right. <laughs> no, huge fan, huge fan. Um, I think I like angling all my rants at at the jazz musician culture <laughs> because they've that that's also a, a community that's very opinionated more often sure. than not yeah but but claims to be super open-minded but it's you get to a certain point and they're not at all yeah um uh, and so and they're equally as opinionated so i kind of like to personally uh aim my rants that way <laughs> because because they've they've i feel like they've already uh entered the rant circle they're already <laughs> pro rants about some like okay cool then let's rant um they, they can voice their opinions about how nothing is hip anymore or you know jazz isn't jazz or whatever whatever the rants are um yeah so i like to angle all mine at them it's, it doesn't make any point to like rant at pop culture because i don't feel like 
the majority of those people are as opinionated about music as the jazz musician is. Sure. Yeah. And it's, I mean, totally. I mean, when you've spent so much time on your craft, it, I think it in some ways uh, comes with the territory and you have to work really hard when you're outside of the circles. Cause yeah, of course it's like, you know, if I'm, you know, hanging out with another musician who like we're on the same gig and we're doing a theater run and we played the show like 50 times in a row, like who else are you going to share that with? You know, <laughs> right, right, right. It's like, I'm not going to share it with someone that's not in it because then, you know, this whole thing turns, wow, they're really like, seem to be irritated about this very specific thing. And, and you <laughs> yeah, go, no, no, I'm actually, I'm actually fine. Yeah. Um, you're right. This is highly specific. This is this yeah. is for a very narrow set of people, and that's that in a way too is like kind of that um, uh, professional solidarity is one of I think the greatest things about or, or what I should say one of the greatest, but it's a nice thing about being part of a subgroup of yes. of, of people is you can you know one line and everyone can like laugh about something that's hyper hyper specific content. <laughs> right. Right. I completely agree. I completely yeah. agree. Now, I don't play a lot of shows, um, yeah. theater productions. Like, I yeah. just got done with one uh, that ran from, like, October to January. And um, it sounds like you play a lot more of those than me. How do you kind of just still stay mentally engaged with this same music uh, night after night? Like, let's say you're doing, I don't know, what's standard? Four four shows a week? Like Thursday uh, and a double on Sunday or something? Yeah, my, mine's an eight-show-a-week schedule Wednesday. Oh, through wow. Sunday. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, I tend to get a very... I try to get fixated on details. And I take a lot of pride in trying to do the same thing every night. Um, and it it's all, it's all show-dependent, of course. Like, if you... Right. Are playing a show that has some like uh, you know big band type stuff or or whatever, and you just get changes. Um, you know, it can be fun to to switch those up, but then you have to like think about okay, what's the keyboard playing? And sometimes you know the keyboard will actually play the walking bass line. I know, I know, but <laughs> it, there, there are sonic reasons for that too. In particular, if you're in a space where the the bass is not tracking well on stage, the vocalist really actually needs it. Sure. So. If, if you know you're doing something like that where there's doubling, you actually do need to play the same thing every night. But if you have more freedom, um, you know, you can stretch out a little bit more. But, um, you know, to me, I just take I, uh, you know, not every night's different where you, you know, some nights it's harder than others to like really stay in it psychologically. But for, for me, I just get a lot of pleasure out of taking something and trying to make it um better throughout the run sure. and also simply just challenging myself to play really consistently like i came up in in um you know playing both classical and you know you know did you know i played in like high school big band and and did um you know a couple tours and all that but i really went in school i was really doing the classical track and doing other stuff on the outside but so you know one of the things in the classical world is like when you're preparing for orchestral auditions it's like just can you play this excerpt 10 times in a row and can you play it, uh, you know, at an extremely high level all 10 times? And so right. in a way, I suppose that that kind of mentality translated really well into doing show work. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know, man, I think it's like in some ways, you know, really, I'm, I'm not saying these are the same, but the mentality of like going in and, and kind of being selfless to the production is. Sure, sure is is nice and like i was saying earlier i really enjoy going in and having other people say this is this is what we're going for make it happen or this is exactly what we want you to do and then i'll make that happen um or at least i'll try my best to make it happen yeah. and so i guess to answer your question i just um i i just try to go in there every night and and play and play my best and understand what the larger infrastructure is that I'm participating sure. in. Like, if you go in there and you want to play something different every single night, this probably isn't your gig. And even though it's a consistent paycheck and all those things, you're probably going to be kind of miserable. So if you can't readjust self psychologically, 
for what this gig is, it's it's just not it's not for you, and that's cool. Right. Like I've played with a lot of uh, a lot of really good players who um, I, I'd say show work is probably not the thing that they really want to be doing, and that sure. um, and that's it, you know it's like we were saying earlier, it's good to know when something isn't for you because then yeah. you don't have to be upset about it anymore. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Right, right. You, you're not you're not frustrated because someone else is working, you know, eight gigs a week, you know, and you, you got a couple that are maybe highly creative. Yeah. But but the work isn't the same at the same volume. But it's like, okay, well, that's fine. They can do that. Like, I don't want to do that, or that's not for me, or whatever. I mean, I think we all fundamentally want to work as much as possible. Sure. But um, but realizing that, like, okay, that's not for me. Uh. I was just talking about this too on the same podcast that I recorded earlier this week about knowing, being okay with that, just been just being okay with like, yeah, you know what, show work isn't my thing. For me personally, I like to do one a year and I'm good. Uh-huh. Like that's it's something different than all the other stuff I do. You know, well, one a year is fun, and I'm good and I'm engaged. You know, if I if I had more than one or if I was on a you know touring show or something. I get dark super quick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and I don't want that because there's I I can stay at home. I don't have to be on the road to get super dark. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that man, that ends up being really contagious, and then the whole the whole thing can tank. Right. Um, and 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 no one's in a good place, and it's just um. Yeah, I think there are, there. Are, I mean, you know, a lot of it's just like inner work. To be honest, it's just like some some personalities just bend towards not being the right fit and if you're on the edge i think there are some things you can do to you know just inner work to try to make it um you know to 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 basically i i I always say i think i'm i'm pretty good at compartmentalizing it and just being like this is this serves this function in my life um i'm fortunate that i get stuff out of it but man that's not the only thing i do i do I do other things and that isn't that's what helps keep it keep it balanced. I also just think sometimes uh our culture has really been bent towards this way of like if you're currently not feeling good about whatever, you need to make a wholesale change. There's no tweaking, there's no like trying to right the ship a little bit. You need to completely change everything that you're doing your entire mindset. And I, I have found, um, if there's something I'm not like really satisfied with, um, it, it, you start by making some tweaks to see if that makes a difference. Like, you know, I know right now with this whole, you know, um, virus, a lot of, I think a lot of people are probably struggling, um, to like find meaning in their day because sure. you don't know, necessarily have uh, some you know a lot of people in our world don't have work um yeah and, and then it's like i found this entire time i mean minus just the anxiety of this thing um <laughs> right, right to be to be actually kind of like all right well this is what the situation is so let's how can we build within this framework yeah. to make for a day where i'm doing stuff that i that i enjoy and that could be a transcription i was playing bach earlier today i taught a lesson nice. and i'll probably you know take a walk around the neighborhood but you know it's just like you don't have to make a whole you don't have to do a wholesale change necessarily you just need to make a tweak and so it's like exactly what you were yeah. saying with okay i'm i acknowledge that i'm really missing this cool let's yeah. try to get a little bit of that back on my diet yeah and always just trying to stay engaged and not look for my gigging life to completely fulfill all of my artistic uh, and musical <laughs> Oh, yeah, that, that's, that's really dangerous. I mean, that's like, you know, be dating or being with somebody and expecting, like, you're going to – every single interest you share is going to be exactly the same and, like, every – you know, a hundred percent of the relationship is like going to be perfect. It's like, what, where, what, that doesn't happen in anything. No, no, it doesn't. <laughs> it's an unreasonable no, it's like expectation. 100%, 100%. And, uh, and I, I, I think about it a lot in terms of that model because, uh, I've been married before and like, I couldn't, I couldn't have put on her to be like, well, you got to joke around like the guys do, you know, mm-hmm. 
Or like if I come home after a gig, you probably don't want to go to a diner and talk about the gig. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like there's, there's, there's different outlets for for different things. And um, all that being said, musically, it, it's I think it's the exact same. And uh, I think it's cool that you're working on the original project. Yeah, it's a real labor of love. Um, you just... You know, at least in my group, I, you know, when it ceases to be fun and we've had a couple moments, I think, where we've collectively, um, you know, been like, OK, this this has been too much of this. Like, let's get back to the basics of just why, why are we even still doing this thing? Oh, that's right. We really like making music together. Right. Cool. Let's let's make sure that that becomes a focus. So it's like 90 percent of my time is not spent booking because right. that is you know, just <laughs> Now, you know, now I just, you know, again, it's like compartmentalizing, uh, just compartmentalizing these tasks. What's the, uh, what's the name of the band? Uh, Mole Hill, like mountain out of a mole hill. Oh, okay. Yeah. What, uh, what do you guys got out so far? Oh, uh, we... Some records out or some stuff yeah, on Spotify or something? Yeah, we put out a full length. We put out three EPs and a couple singles. Um, so, you know, you get a pretty, pretty decent idea and, you know, we're, we're all over all over the socials, YouTube, all that, all that stuff. So, pre-Corona, how how are bookings going? How it's what's the? Are you guys staying specific to Chicago? All that? Are you doing like some regional runs? Are you playing um, outside the city in the state? We toured a lot more in the past. Like we've probably played four or five hundred dates as a band, like from Omaha to New York, and okay. um, we we toured more in the past, and um, we're we're mainly more sticking to Chicago and regional, uh, you know, we were out in Corning, New York. We got, um, played at Corning glass museum. Actually, it was a really fun gig. Um, you know, so we're, we're more in Chicago now, Just, you know, everyone's getting, you know, getting older and, you know, things get complicated with touring and all that. But, um, we still try to go out every couple months, even if it's just for a long weekend or something and do that. And we, we really love playing live together. So, we we try to do that as as much as we can. So um so yeah. Is the uh, the other guys in the group are they are they working guys like working musician guys or are they because uh, I know that that can be yeah having yeah. a band that's a band when everybody's <laughs> you know gigging for their yeah, livelihood that, is a huge scheduling uh, complication. Yeah, Devin the drummer he he's. Um, he and I are like kind of the guys, um, working musicians. Uh, he, his main gig is like, he, you know, plays at church on Sunday and, um, you know, rehearsals Thursday. And then he freelances, uh, you know, with other people in between that. Um, yeah. And then the keyboard player and lead singer, they have, they have day jobs. Um, and, but you know, we make it work. I, you know, I gotta say like the other three guys in my band are like three of the coolest, you know, coolest dudes who are like at their core, very kind and generous wow. people, That's which, yeah. which like, and, and you know, there's still disagreements and conflicts, but the simple fact is, is that the three of them would be there for you if something went down and that, right. that in it, in itself is like, you know, kind of the glue that keeps this thing together and keeps people uh, being respectful and, and all that. So, yeah, yeah. I think, um, I think that it's necessary to a certain point to have disagreements because that means everybody is feeling comfortable enough and safe enough in the environment to voice their personal concerns and interests. Uh, because if someone is just going to be like, yeah, sure, whatever you want to do, that means that they're not that invested. Yeah, for sure. It's um, yeah. I mean, the lead singer and I, Peter, we have worked together for so many years at this point. I mean, we've gotten some pretty big um you know, disagreements about some stuff, but I feel, you know, we've always been able to resolve it, um, over a period of time or sometimes immediately. And that, um, you know, there's just a level of mutual respect. And sure. as, if that ever leaves, you're in big trouble. <laughs> right. So, right. That's, yeah. that's when things, uh, yeah, that's, that's when it's not cool. It's like, I, personally, I'd be fine I'm fine with the disagreements. Like, okay, cool. That means you have an opinion that you pe feel passionately about. Great. Absolutely. Cool. Well, so do I. Now we just got to figure out where the middle is to all this. Um, because when there's not that, then there's, there's just somebody or maybe more than one person is just a yes man. You know, 
it was like, well, then I can find anybody who's that. Like, you're not really bringing much to the table. You know, bring some opinions, bring some uh, ideas, bring something to the table. Yeah, Instead totally. of just going with the flow all the time. Like, you know, working-wise, I think we're all uh, aware that we're disposable. But coming from this, you know, a core situation where you guys are friends, too, there's a personal connection there, which I think is huge and will always, always get communicated in the music. Absolutely, yeah. Ryan, I'm sorry, man. I got to end this thing, unfortunately. Oh, <laughs> all good, man. All good. Uh, thanks for the time. I know you had, you had told me you had somewhere to be. Um, yeah, yeah. No worries, man. We'll have you back on. Yeah, it was awesome to chat with you, man. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Yeah, likewise, dude. We'll stay in touch. All right. Sounds great, man. Talk to you. All right. All right. Bye. All right, that was my talk with Trevor. He he did. He did let me know that he had like a small window to have a, a conversation and I wasn't keeping track of the time. I'm obviously glad he was. Um uh, but uh so maybe the the brand the the ending sounds a little bit more abrupt than uh it was. Like I I knew I knew about it, but I wasn't paying attention. That's on me. Um I I was like getting caught up in all these like rambling rants about things. Which is funny because him and I were discussing the nature of rants. Um, uh, but I edited some of that out because it was annoying. And uh, I think because of this quarantine situation like and not engaging with people you know, regularly, I'm just kind of stuck at the apartment. Um, but I get on a podcast and <laughs> I just won't shut up. Uh, and so I cut a lot of that out and then emailed Trevor and apologized <laughs> for rambling like an idiot. <laughs> that happened. Um. Yeah, that's that's that, folks. That was a, that was a good time with Trevor. He, I feel like he's gonna be back. We're gonna we're gonna t- check in with him again. I like I like Trevor a lot, and I like what he's up to and the work him and Jason Heath are doing. Definitely check out Contra Base Conversations if you are not a listener already. Clearly, you're listening to podcasts, so go check out that one. Uh, I like that podcast a lot. That's what I got on that, folks. That's Trevor's story, and uh, I will catch you on the next one. <laughs>